Hello everyone, and thank you for visiting TUJ Room. TUJ Room is a new program uh, to commem commemorate uh, TUJ's 30th anniversary year. And each time we'll bring a special guest and to talk about business leadership, uh, the school, uh, the importance of education, and so on. My name is Midori Kaneko, and I'm a chairperson of TUJ's board. And today, our first guest is one of the board members, a strong advocate for TUJ, Bill Bishop. So let's welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining, Bill. Um, you've been uh, in Japan for how many years? Uh, that's, uh, well, it depends on how you calculate it, I okay. guess. Uh, I first came to Japan in 1974, but this time uh, I came back in 1990. So it'll be 22 years this year. Wow, 22 years. Mm -hmm. Well, you were originally a temple um, a graduate, but what brought you uh, to Japan? Uh, originally, in 1974, uh, when I first came to Japan, uh, I was a photographer uh, in the U.S. Navy. And um, I came over here, uh, and I had some duties in Southeast Asia and uh, in other parts of Asia. But I was basically stationed in Japan in the most of and I returned to the States in 1976, and uh, actually I was originally a University of Maryland student, but uh, I came back to Japan and I studied in uh, Sophie University. Mm -hmm. And just at the time I was graduating, I graduated in 1981, and I was returned to the States in 1982 to start my graduate studies at Temple University, by coincidence. <laughs> and here's a, the interesting part of the story is, is that uh, just as I was leaving Japan to go to Temple University Graduate School, Temple was establishing in Japan wow. the Temple University campus, which will be 30 years this year. And uh, so I went back to graduate school at Temple, and I graduated from there. Uh, and I came back to Japan, I went back to the States, and now I'm back in Japan again. So the total of how many years uh, you think you've lived in Japan? Uh, math was never a strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe 30 years. Yeah, that's a long time. And uh, you have been very active with uh, American Chamber of, uh, of Commerce in yes. Japan. Yes. And uh, which has uh, very uh, strong uh, advocacy mm -hmm. uh, initiatives and so on. Yes. Uh, so what have you been doing uh, with um, Amcham? Yes. Uh, well, with the American Chamber of Commerce, of course, I've been involved with them, well, since this time in 1990, but uh, I was a member prior to that. But, mm -hmm. uh, since then, I've served in many different capacities. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been chair of the Government Relations Committee, and I, I was a vice president of the chamber for a number of years. Uh, and I'm currently the chair of the uh, Health Care Committee, which has five subcommittees. Uh, uh, covering the full range from pharmaceuticals, devices, diagnostics, IT. But uh, in that, in those activities, of course, uh, you might uh, refer to the uh, chamber as a atsuryoku uh, danta, you know, a pressure group uh, here in Japan, uh, applying the gaiatsu, you know, the internal pressure, external pressure on the system. But that's not uh, necessarily true. We view ourselves as being inside the castle. Mm -hmm. And so we're not trying to get into Japan to do business. We're already here. And our position is, is that we, because many of the companies of the chamber are global companies, mm -hmm. uh, that we would like to bring global best practices to Japan, not just U.S. practices. Uh, and so the point is, is that uh, we advocate for those mm -hmm. uh, across all sectors, and of course in my area, because I'm in the healthcare area, of course we uh, advocate in that area. And of course Temple University is uh, advocating for uh, education, mm -hmm. uh, more international education, critical thinking, uh, the uh, educational methods which are used uh, mm -hmm. in the United States. Uh, and internationally mm -hmm. uh, to be more accepted here in Japan. Yeah. So I think uh, those uh, efforts have been some successful more than others, but uh, quite frankly, we do not see ourselves outside of pressure. We see it internal. So you have Nayatsu, mm -hmm. 
or, or gaiatsu, something from the outside, naiatsu, something internally, and I guess we're shiatsu. Mm -hmm. We're yes. kind of working the system. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, you know, I was also a board member uh, a few, several years ago yes. for uh, ACCJ. And from that time, I see, I started to see some change in uh, the attitude. Mm. And then there was a word called the uh, Sori Kyosen. Yeah, yeah that's with right. the Charles Lake's uh, the era. Right, uh, Sori Kyosen. Kyosen yes. You know, mm -hmm. really working together and really living together, right. more like a partnership. Right. So Gaiatsu is more like for the past. Yeah. Uh, but from your point of view, though, I really wanted to uh, uh, ask this question. And in the eyes of a uh, uh, temple, uh, you know, TUJ as well, how do you see the leadership of Japan as a country mm -hmm. uh, in the region, especially in the well, Asia Pacific? Well, and that's another thing that's going on. Of course, uh, we're involved with the chamber, of course, that's with Japan. Uh, I also engage with uh, APEC the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation. There are 21 countries. Japan is one of those, so is the U.S. Under this is the free trade area of the Asia-Pacific. They call it the FTAP, uh, the F-T-A-A-P. Uh, and you may have read in the paper a lot of the um, discussion here in Japan, the struggle that Japan is having uh, with uh, internal groups to try and determine whether or not they want to participate in something called TPP, mm -hmm. the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which really is a stepping stone towards this FTAP. Uh, and FTAP, uh, the, the free trade area of the Asia Pacific, is really a goal of APEC. Uh, by 2020, there would be this free trade area. And depending on your level of development of your economy, it would be more integrated than others. Mm -hmm. There would be some uh, adjustments. Japan being a developed economy like the US, Canada, and, uh, of course there would be much more integration at those, uh, for those economies, including agriculture. And I think it's in these issues that Japan is struggling to figure out what role they would like to play. Mm -hmm. And the trade architecture of Asia, uh, initially, if you want to look at the East Asian trade architecture is really the ASEAN countries, there are 10 of them, uh, the Asia-Pacific uh, uh, countries of Southeast Asia. And then you have, it's called ASEAN plus three, and the plus three is China, Japan, and Korea. And ASEAN plus three make the East Asian trade uh, zone. Uh, that's a nice architecture, but it, it locks out uh, the U.S., it locks out uh, Australia, many other major trading partners. And so there's something called ASEAN plus six, mm -hmm. uh, which actually pulls in India, Australia, and New Zealand, uh, as well as Japan, Korea, and China with the ASEAN countries. That's good too, but that's not the Asia Pacific. This is mm -hmm. the Far East then, mm -hmm. uh, and Southeast uh, Asia with, China, uh, with India. So uh, the idea of the T uh, of APEC was to include Chile and, uh, you know, uh, the, the South American countries, the Central American countries, North American countries in this greater Asia-Pacific uh, free trade area. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that's the challenge now. Mm -hmm. And so what is the role of the U.S.? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the role of Japan? Uh, is this a, a way to counter China? Mm -hmm. uh, which actually it probably is not. Uh, because China is on the outside just like Japan is on the outside if you're looking at a ASEAN plus three. Mm -hmm. uh, but who's going to have leadership right. uh, in these areas? And so uh, I think Japan is struggling now to determine what is its role outside and one of the, the things that's become very, very apparent is that there's a lack of a focused voice for Japan outside of Japan. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in many of the uh, gatherings in Asia, the, the language, it happens to be English, mm -hmm. uh, that is being used even in Asia as, uh, at conferences and whatnot. And, and it may not be a problem so much with the English language, it's mm -hmm. the fact they have no one standing up mm -hmm. saying, this is what Japan thinks, mm -hmm. or this is the direction that Japan should go. And, and uh, I think uh, this has uh, created a, a kind of vacuum.
Mm -hmm. uh, which then China tries to fill, mm -hmm. Korea is attempting to fill, uh, and I think this is, uh, this is a problem for Japan longer term. They need to step up mm -hmm. and actually take the reins of leadership mm -hmm. that uh, the U.S. and others would like to see them take. It's sort of, you know, lack of a strong leadership, mm -hmm. um, the ownership, and also perhaps um, the courage to stand up. Mm -hmm. as seems to be quite deep-rooted uh, yeah. uh, in our society. Yeah. Uh, how, how, um, you know, how do you see that linked to our education mm -hmm. in Japan versus what the schools like Temple uh, can offer? Yeah, there may be a cultural uh, legacy uh, for Japan to be uh, more quiet uh, in these kinds of uh, international settings. I think Japan, on the other hand, uh, we can look at it from an economic point of view, Japan has benefited greatly from flying stealth uh, by not being the nail that's sticking up, they're not getting pounded down, by not being uh, out front mm -hmm. on the issue but allowing others to lead, to lead from behind, so to speak. Japan has been very successful uh, and I think with the break of the Cold War, the change of the, the new emerging economies, uh, the new uh, structure. It's not the G7 or G8, uh, it's the G20. It's a, it's a different world we live in now. Uh, that now, more than ever, Japan needs to step up. But Japan is still operating on the old paradigm. And you might say that the U.S. Uh, and many countries in the West are still suffering from the old paradigm. They haven't yet adjusted fully uh, uh, to take advantage of the new paradigm. And uh, taking advantage of that new paradigm will require a different approach. Uh, it's a multipolar world. Uh, and so in that regard, uh, Japan, I think, is well positioned to take advantage, but it might be this lack of tools. Uh, and that might be uh, because of educational uh, foundations uh, that many of the leaders have. Though many of the younger leaders have been educated overseas. And you see that, that they have the ability I think uh, it's now having the vision for Japan to, to speak out. Mm -hmm. I think it's in that that Temple plays a very significant role uh, and can play an even larger role going forward to help Japan uh, you know, step up and play the role that it, mm -hmm. it should. Yeah. No, thank you. I mean, that's a very important point. But in uh, the meantime, um, um, we do have um, a very small uh, talent pool. Mm -hmm. To really face the globalization, yes. you know, and uh, I mean, I really feel uh, fearful about the yeah. future, yeah. and uh, we need to bring more uh, talent from overseas as well. Yeah. Uh, how, how is that sort of openness of the country, mm -hmm. and uh, how can, for example, UJ graduates uh, be able to position themselves, uh, you know, for their career? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that. Uh uh, well, uh, let's just take the example of my own company. I mean, uh, that we would want uh, the insight that uh, professionals in Japan could bring to the rest of our operations in the world, there's no doubt. Mm -hmm. It's finding those professionals in Japan who want to be global, right? We're a global company, and of course we have many local areas. We operate in over 50 countries. And many of the employees who are in those countries will work in those countries. They're not going to fly all over the world uh, to different management positions. But on the other hand, there is an opportunity for any of those professionals to rise up in the organization and actually one day be president of the company or even chairman. Uh, we're a global company. Uh, the problem we have found in Japan, and it may not be unique only to Japan, but Japan being the developed country, it probably does stand out as unique is there isn't enough talent in Japan who's willing to go the global route, you know, and actually become part of that integrated global leadership team. And I think if we do have a few uh, professionals now who have grown up in the Japanese uh, operation or now uh, serving at headquarters and in other locations around the world, uh, yeah, I think in time it can happen. What needs to happen, however, is for them not only to have experience in the company, but to have experience in this kind of, uh, what the kind of education, the critical thinking, uh, that a uh, education that Temple 
uh, and universities in the United States or in Europe uh, can provide. One of the big problems is that many, uh, you noted, and of course this is in the paper, that in the government, and now has seen this as a problem, is trying to figure out how to solve it, is the number of students who desire to study overseas has declined, yeah. coming from Japan. And so you don't have that talent coming back. And if they do come back, they, it's difficult to find a job uh, in Japan for some of them, or they feel it is, despite the fact there's a high demand for them. Uh, so I think there's a mismatch in the mind. There probably is much bigger demand than people think, and they're not taking advantage of uh, you know, pursuing uh, that more international education. Uh, which would give them a step up with the competition. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, the Japanese are kind of conservative a little bit, this younger generation. What do you think? Well, I, I, mean, I have a different opinion. Yeah. I think the ones uh, in their early 20s mm -hmm. are now really in search of their own values. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think they're going to really emerge. Mm -hmm. And especially you know, with the so, uh, social network. Yeah, uh, I think they are bonding and they're really exchanging their views, and so there will be some emerging sort of uh, the the, uh, the generation yeah. of a new leadership. Yeah. Uh, but like you said, uh, mm. we need tools, and right. they need tools, right. and uh, you know places like um, you know TUJ mm. where you can get you know I mean, the, the education, the American education, right, right in uh, in Tokyo mm. is uh, some uh, special place to be. But uh, you know, if the Japanese education doesn't change, mm. and you can't be just you know, mourning about it, I think you know there's a lot you know, the one can do mm. to really be aware of the uh, the needs of uh, leadership, ownership, right. Right. and right. The independent thinking, critical thinking. Yeah. If the school don't really provide you that, then they should really search for for themselves. Yeah. And I think that's the part of the reason why uh, Temple University graduates has much higher placement rate in comparison to many other schools. You know, the job market is uh, really wanting this kind of uh, the, the talent. Uh, yeah, that's for sure. I mean, um, that speaks for itself right there. Uh, that the hesitation to do that or to pursue those studies, uh, is it's interesting there would be hesitation when in fact those who do pursue those studies are probably more likely to be employable than those that, that happen. So. Uh, yeah, it, it's. Uh, I don't think that's well publicized. I don't think it's well understood uh, by the general population exactly what's going on. What does globalization really mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think that's where Temple really does play a, a very significant role because rather than oh, I got to send them off to you know Canada, the United States, UK, or whatnot, mm -hmm. you can get that same education right here in Japan. Right. Or you can start to get that education mm -hmm. right here in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the same degree, it's the same courses, it's the same content, it's the same uh, you know, structure of thinking, it's the same tools. You can gain those right here and you could still be living at home if, if that's what you chose to do. And I think it, that's unique. It's also unique for those students in Asia who are looking and they say, uh, well, we want that education and but they can get that starting point here in Japan because they may be interested in Japan. They don't have the language yet, but they could study in English. They could continue to pursue and, and gain uh, credits and, and education as they study uh, about Japan uh, and to experience this as well, yeah. kind of get the double benefit. I think that that's where the TUJ, uh, you know, Japan campus is really unique in that mm -hmm. regard because. There, well, there aren't many like it. No, no. I mean, the TUJ already have uh, 4,500 you know, alumni members. Right. It's a huge you know, the number of people who's been you know, right. educated here. And the fact that you know, they, we have uh, 60 countries mm -hmm. or more uh, students. So yeah. it's not just getting American education in Japan, but right. it's very, very diverse. It's almost right. like a mini, miniature globe right. you know, where you, you're living you know, day to day. It's yeah. a great. Uh, sort of uh, the foundation that you can build while yeah. uh, you're still young yeah. and being educated. Well, year on year, that's building in that alumni association, of course, those links, and we think that we don't think much of that. Mm -hmm. But I, as I've gotten older, 
uh, it, those alumni connections become more and more important to you. You don't think much of it, you just kind of want to get graduated and get on with life, you know. But as you get older, you look back uh, fondly on those years that you spent, uh, uh, you know, when you're really in close camaraderie with the rest of the students in your class. May not have thought much of it at the time, may have thought a lot about it. But as the years go by, you think back on it, you do think more and more mm -hmm. uh, how important that was to you. Uh, and that that alumni kind of support network can mm -hmm. uh, play, it's an additional, uh, well, value yeah. uh, to yeah. your education, beyond your education, as you say, 60 different countries, a web of people, you know, soon to be over 5,000, I mean, it's, it's something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you know, 30 years of a commitment is yeah. a long time being in Japan. Um, just the, you know, uh, last part of our, um, the, you know, the talk, you talked about, um, you know, some of the, uh, the people, especially, you know, the uh, politicians, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you are acquainted, yes. you know, and uh, they're educated oh, overseas, yeah. and you're more like a new kind of uh, the leadership. Yeah, and so let's talk a little bit about the positive side of mm. uh, what's emerging in Japan, and yeah. how are they behaving differently uh, from old days, and mm. what are they trying to really change uh, in Japan? Well, yeah, I have noted, uh, of course, for a politician to go to the United States in the 50s and the 60s to get educated, uh, and the, or, you know, as a student and then come back and become a politician and go into politics, the chance of that or the number of those students would be very small, of course. But as time went on and uh, people had the opportunity to study overseas, it is an amazing number of politicians that I've met, uh, we currently the Democratic uh, party of Japan's in, in charge, DPJ, and as you meet them, they're Georgetown University graduates, they went to Tulane, they went to Yale, they went to Harvard, they went here and there and everywhere, and you find out that these are very highly educated folks, you know, they've not only were they educated highly here in Japan, but they have international educations, not always just the United States, some of them have educated in the UK, here and there, and you see that they have a very cosmopolitan view. Uh, they, they're not just bilingual, they're multicultural uh, people who are now setting the policy for the entire country. Surely they're very uh, Japanese, they're very dedicated to their constituency, they, they have interests, but their view of where Japan should be going and its role in the world or, or how they would like to uh, ensure that Japan uh, is secure in the world, but is also highlighted. Very different than this older cadre that was, you know, focused only on Japan, only domestic issues, and, and you know, circle the wagons and let's be careful with barbarians at the gate. So it's a very, very different kind of thinking, and it's quite promising. I think the problem with them, uh, with that cadre, is they have the same problem as everybody has. Changes comes difficult. And Japan, by its nature, is a conservative country. Uh, the culture is conservative, and so radical change is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But progressive change over time, it's definitely happening. And I think um, for those who are capable of having a global perspective, but yet appreciating uh, what Japan can bring, mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be the group that will lead in the future, no doubt about it. And it, it's already starting. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much for closing with such, such a positive yeah. note. So as the leadership become more prominent, mm -hmm. then we'll start feeling the positive change yes. really happening in Japan. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. Okay, and thank you everyone for watching the uh, TUJ Room. Uh, we have a line uh, of um, guests uh, from the board, uh, CEO of uh, Amazon Japan, Jasper. Uh, you know, is uh, our next guest. So please uh, try to access. <laughs> Thank you for making this in the last minute. Uh, this is our, our website, and uh, Bill also talked about the importance mm -hmm. of connecting uh, with the alumni uh, members. Even if you're not thinking today, over time, uh, your friendship uh, and partnership with uh, other alumni members will be uh, very valuable. Mm -hmm. Uh, in your life. And so please uh, visit our site and uh, if you enjoy uh, this program, uh, please uh, forward the link so we can expand this talk from TUJ Room. Thank you and hopefully uh, see you next time. <laughs>